great pleasure to be here with you today. You know, I always I think of my work as being focused upon closing the gap between our highest aspirations and greatest potential and our lived realities. And I know people in the room today are working on that big challenge to close that gap, and you're working on big challenges, so we have big opportunities to do it. So uh, it feels like I'm in the right place with you today. I want to um, talk with you today about 2030 to give you some insights about uh, what it might look like. I'm not going to talk about agriculture and rural development. You're the experts in that. Rather, I'm going to be talking about some of the enabling conditions, uh, some of the challenges that we have moving up to uh, 2030 to give you a sense of what 2030 will be like. So I'm going to talk about these issues of complexity, um, human development, uh, the governance, emerging new governance structures, uh, the finance, we've had some mention of that already, and uh, briefly touch upon the environment. But when we talk about the future, you know, I want to be challenging and provocative for you because we come burdened with our own experiences as well as uh, enlightened by them. And the old ways that we have of doing things, we tend to simply extrapolate into the future and that undermines our ability to be creative and to think of new ways to do things because surely to reach these SDG goals, we're dealing not just with incremental change, not just with trade-offs, but we're dealing with transformational change. So this is what a couple of leading thinkers had to say about a stance towards 2030, right? To challenge us to uh, move towards 2030 in an innovative way. Now when we look at, when we will look back to 2030, we'll have seen two key dynamics at play. One is what I refer to as turbulence. So we have lots of turbulence, lots of sources of it. Change is coming at us from all angles, right? The hyper-technological change, change in our nation states, change in the uh, political economic fragmentation, uh, institutional weakness, um, issues of um, corruption as was mis mentioned. So we're dealing with a highly turbulent environment. But the other key dynamic is connectivity. Those of us in OECD countries are hyper-connected, and by 2030, that'll be the case for the world in general. But it's not just around virtual connection, it's around face-to-face -to -face connection too. We have more, we'll have much, much more travel. We have more people connecting through conferences. We have more people connecting simply through globalization in general. We have greater intergenerational connectivity because we've achieved greater lifetime expectancy than ever before. We have record low levels of poverty. We have record high levels of education attainment. All this is supporting connectivity and surely this is part of the heart of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Treaty. How to connect differently and in more robust ways. So all of this change at the core of it is very relevant to the concept of complexity and it's why I'm going to touch on it uh, today. There's two key issues associated with complexity and when I talk about complexity, I like to use the framework of a colleague of mine, Dave Snowden's. He developed something called the kind of fine framework and the reason I like it is because he talks about not just what complexity is, but what it isn't as well. And it shows us how to work with complexity. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Um. So he talks about it in terms of four action logics, and it's one of four action logics. So these four action logics, the one that we work with usually is around what we call simple. And it's called simple because it can be handled by a simple bureaucracy, a, a, a small number of interactions. It's like when you have a pothole in the road, you call up City Hall get somebody to come and fill in the pothole. It's like when Starbucks opens a new branch. You know, it's done this many times. It knows how to do it. It's a bunch of rep repetitive actions. They've got it down pretty well. So this is where we deal with the world of best practice. It's definable, replicable <coughs> action. But we have this world of complicated as well. And by complicated, I mean, for example, putting a person on the moon, building a dam, Right? This takes lots of people, 
lots of activity, lots of interactions, but it's a clearly defined goal. You know when you get to the dam. You can model it, but you know that you've got options to make, you've got choices to make as you're going about undertaking this complicated activity. So here we deal with good practice rather than best practice. Complexity, on the other hand, is dealing with vague outcomes, our aspirations, right? The SDGs, no one's ever lived in a sustainable society of any scale. This is a different moving into the future. We have to try to envision what the future will be like. This is a world of experimentation. And when I say experimentation, I don't mean necessarily doing something at small scale. Germany's been experimenting with how to develop a sustainable energy system for the last 30 years. Experiments can be at large scale as well. But it requires us trying new things, finding what's successful, looking for patterns, and finding ways to give life and to emerge this new way of being. Now the fourth is chaotic. It's like when the President of the United States suddenly says we're going to not allow people into the country anymore and then what happens? Chaos, right? Everything becomes undefinable. It's more associated with disasters. You know, you suddenly don't have the food, electricity, and water systems you need. So uh, you have to figure out what to do and that requires novel practice. Now there's two key points I want to make out of this with relevance to 2030. Number one, is you've got this uh, movement for your, you're working with complexity. And SDGs are at their essence complex challenges. But you're taking pieces of it and learning how to use it and moving it over to the complicated arena. This is exactly what's happening with sustainable development now uh, with regards to sustainable energy, right? We're getting enough experience with how to develop sustainable energy systems that it's moving from the complex to the complicated. We're building institutions now. So there will be, over the next few years, this big movement, if we're, when we're successful with the SDGs, from complex challenges to complicated ones. Now the second point to make about this is that there is an ordinate pressure, often, to make, to apply tools and methods to the complex challenge that are totally inappropriate for it. Each of these logics requires different sets of tools and methods. So for example, we, with measurement, there's inordinate pressure to apply log frames, results frameworks, and concepts of efficiency to complex situations. That undermines our ability to address and develop the inventiveness because those types of measurement tools require that we define the outcome before we've even undertaken the activity. And you need a different dynamic in, in, in developing complexity. You need a learning and development dynamic that's reflected in measurement practices such as outcome mapping, developmental evaluation, realist evaluation, systemic evaluation. So we've got to learn between now and 19, uh, 2030 how to greatly improve our ability to handle the complex and move into the complicated. Now let me turn for a moment to the human development trends. Demography presents us with perhaps the most robust predictions of what the future will look like. We know that the population will be about 8.5 billion. We know that we'll have much better educated people in the world. We will be having people who are um, better uh, going to school. We will have increased education achievement, so people will be able to do what they can't currently do. So it's great for us for being this added resource. And these are attained, by the way, of uh, examples of moving from complex to complexity, right? We've done family planning out of the morass of how do we handle population growth. We developed this idea of family planning out of the morass of how do we educate people. We've developed education institutions. So these are examples of moving from one to the other. But there's these two core questions moving from those relatively mundane perspectives on human development that I would like to also look at around social economic fragmentation and what's new that's arising in terms of our capacity. And I want to use this perspective of human development stage research. This is research that we look at the long millennia of human development and see different ways that we've been learning and building to be able to act differently. So we can see that about 20,000 years ago, 
We had tribal societies, and their way of explaining how the world worked was based on magic. Then, about uh, 10,000 years ago, out of those tribal societies, individuals grew, where, arose with idol, identity, with ego. And we had societies that organized themselves simply by brute force. This is when slavery arose for the first time. Then, around the era of time when uh, agriculture arose, we ended up developing myth and religion as key organizing forces and key ways of understanding our societies. And only about nine, uh, 400 years ago did we have science emerge and have natural laws, but they were think, thought of as a sort of clockwork mechanism that would be able to help us ex exploit nature and take from nature. About 200 years ago, we had the emergence of this concept of equality, of human equality. It gave birth to the nation state in democratic form. It gave rise to the concept of human rights, of empowerment, and more recently, multi-stakeholder practices. But we have something new now that's emerging that's a socio-ecological mindset. This is being driven by connectivity people who are connecting across differences as never before. You know, I had a webinar that I was giving uh, that had a senior Swedish diplomat on the webinar, an elderly Swedish diplomat, and there was a 19 or 20 year old Zimbabwean on the webinar. And the Zimbabwean was explaining, or the dip senior diplomat was explaining how critical it is to have face-to-face -face conversations on an ongoing, intense basis. And this 19 or 20 year old Zimbabwean said, that's fine for you, uh, you have the money to travel. You should see what I'm doing with my friends in India and in Brazil. We're making real change together, right? This is a generation that's lived with, uh, just growing up, it's not like us who have had to learn how to use the internet, right? It's just being part of the air they breathe. This is a generation that loves collaboration, that loves working in teams, that loves the innovation and the new. It's a generation that is connecting in new ways. It's driven by self-actualization. It's asking questions about whether it's their actions are aligned with their deepest held values. It's a group that is driven by the idea of dispersed leadership, self-leadership, you know, and not uh, where people can take independent action. They don't wait for somebody on the side to say, okay, you can do that, but can take actions. And this is giving birth to new organizational forms, new forms for us in terms of governance, which I'll speak to in a minute. But let's first of all go back to that question about socio-political fragmentation and think about that in this different way. So the complicated fact is that our societies, Western societies, have people at all of these different perspectives at the same time. It's not as though everyone suddenly moves to a new uh, perspective, right? And in fact, the analysis of Western societies suggests there's only about 20% of the population that is at the equality or the socio-ecological framework of development in, in terms of their mental models. About 30% is in the scientific exploit the earth model, and about 50% is at the pre-scientific stage in their logic. You know, you can see in the United States how this is bursting forth, right? We have a president now who's basically a brute force guy. <laughs> right? So, these are some of the challenges that are happening in our world, and it's not going to end soon because it's embedded in the way people are thinking, but I feel relatively optimistic that we are having the birth and the pressure and all of the forces of connectivity are going to give uh, rise to a greater group in the socio-ecological group over the period of time that we'll see between here and 2030. So let me move <coughs> to this concept of governance. So what I mean by governments, governance is ways we collectively set direction and take action to realize that direction. And this is the post-1945 model in the Western world, right? We had big business, big government, big labor coming out of the first, the Second World War, and they got together to be able to deliver the social contract. If there was a dispute between labor and business, well, we knew government was in charge, and government would decide finally and be the final arbitrator. But what we have now is a new type of governance that's emerging, what I call sustainable governance world. So one key factor here is that all of our actions are about 
how are we impacting the natural environment? Because we know, as was shown, that we have limited carrying capacity on our precious planet. And we have these three sectors that still exist, but they're working together in different ways. They're both operating independently and they're overlapping a lot more. And I know this is what your real experience, real experience is. But we have these three sectors because they have particular things that they can do well, right? Government's role is really about setting rules and enforcing rules. Government's uh, business's role is really about wealth generation. And community-based organizations are really about community well-being. Now, the problem is they all have their own weaknesses too, right? Government uh, left on its own makes uh, crazy statements that are just uh, don't seem to touch the earth. I mean, we've seen lots of this with IGOs, right? Um, <laughs> of statements that we don't really think are going to ever have. How do we ever give life to them? We know that business left on its own is maniacal about wealth generation. It will ignore the impact, the negative externalities that it has on other sectors. And we know that civil society on its own will simply appear to be bleeding hearts without any real impact. So out of those types of insights and natural dynamics, we've started to have this new type of organization built that I call global action networks. So this is an institutional innovation. Many people look at these and say, oh, those are basically NGOs or IGOs. This is applying an old framework to a new entity. These are not NGOs and they're not IGOs. They're an, it, an institutional innovation that is weaving together all of these different sectors to be able to take on these big change challenges. So you probably recognize the Global Compact. I did uh, some work with the a report that went to Kofi Annan in 1999 that gave birth to the Global Compact. It was called Critical Choices, uh, the Future of the UN Networks and Global Governance. Kofi recognized there was something beyond <laughs> the IGO world, and he was looking for it. This is what I've been working with for uh, about a dozen years. You can see the ILC um, up here, International Land Coalition, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So the way I look at the ILC, is that it's mobilized a diverse group of people to be able to ensure the land equity principles are integrated into international agreements. I know they did this with the African Union. And then when that's successful, they change the enabling environment and they can work at the local level, the national level. They're now getting 2026 20, national levels uh, uh, nodes that where they can give life to this principle and work with all the stakeholders that are necessary to give life to it. So in developing these, giving life to these wonderful principles that the IGOs uh, create, it's important to understand these emerging new mechanisms for actually realizing them. So I want to talk just briefly about the principles behind these. Number one, they build coalitions of the committed. This is not like a UN organization that says all the nations in the world have a right to participate. No. If you're committed to these goals, then we encourage you to join us. But we aren't out about, we aren't, we, it's not about everyone in the world joining us. We, and we encourage people to become committed, of course. This is not about citizenship. It's not about membership. They all have some support of membership, but that's not the key core dynamic that's driving them. It's about participation. If you want to have influence in these organizations, it's about taking action to be able to participate. They create spaces to work in that, cross, uh, that go across boundaries that are inhibiting our ability to work, like national boundaries, across geographic boundaries. Transparency International did a marvelous job of integrating its principles at the global perspective into the global compact, into the OECD and others. This is working at, in spaces rather than our traditional sense of boundaries. And finally, we have them structured as decentralized inter-organizational networks. So this is not a, an organization with a lot of offices and branch offices, right? These are nodes, self-activating nodes in the network. So these are operating with the logic of that new socio-ecological mindset that's coming to the fore. And they work as trust networks. If they lose trust of their stakeholders, they have lost all of their power. 
So that's critical. Now I want to talk about another innovation and uh, so social uh, societal change systems. And this innovation, we, it, it arose to us out of work I did uh, with a team looking at the energy system, the, the system, the efforts to integrate sustainability in the energy system at a global level. So this was global actors. And when we looked at it, we quickly understood that it was important to distinguish between the production system and the change system. <coughs> and they have an intertwining, like this double helix, they have an intertwining relationship. But the production system is a complicated system. It's about utilities generating, transmitting, and producing electricity, right? Whereas the change system is a complex system. It's got many more actors. It's got, uh, at the global level, what we were dealing with, it's got uh, intergovernmental networks like ARENA. It's got um, networks that are NGO networks, like the Climate Action Network. It's got um, networks like the Carbon Disclosure Project, which are multi-stakeholder networks. Right? It's got business networks, like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And they're all working on this system. So this is an, an innovation, because when you think of it as a change system, you can actually create a very powerful change system, and that gets really exciting. So let's look at this in terms of Kenya, and some work I did in Kenya around financial inclusion. As you may know, in Kenya, uh, the access to the financial system has doubled in the last 10 years. So this is a short time, right? From It's now about 76% of the population, adult population, has access to financial services in Kenya. This is what the production system looks like, right? And this is a value network uh, analysis map. So we have here the central bank that's involved with these activities of enforcing and measuring. We have the government here. It's involved with organizing the system. And the government sends legislation to create the central bank. It identifies who's on the central bank. And the central bank is responsible for delivering um, economic growth and financial system stability. So that's how to read this map. But you can see there's a few actors in this map, a few activities that are critical. We've got to have the banks as the key producers within the system, the consumers taking their services, courts also involved in enforcing, and of course, um, these uh, business bank associations. So then we said, well, what does the change system look like if that's the production system? And this is what we saw as the change system. So we, of course, still have you know, this whole system of, of actors, but they're doing different things in terms of the change system need. The government is uh, setting the vision about financial inclusion. It's helping to prototype new legislation. Most of these uh, production system actors are involved in some form of prototyping. And then on the right-hand side here, we have all of these organizations that are, new, that are added on just to be able to help the change happen. So they're undertaking different activities. For instance, we've got resourcing here. Who's going to fund all this activity? Well, we have uh, Gates Foundation, DFID, the World Bank. And we've got to keep people active and activated and pressing for this change, or else it'll just collapse. And so we've got a lot here involved in advocating. There's one particular interesting organization called AFI, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. It's a global NGO network of central bankers. So you never thought of central bankers as activists, I'm sure, but this is what they're doing globally. Hmm? So this is what the change system looks like. Now the third innovation is this, whoops, is this concept of a societal change system steward. So we have that here, FSD, financial sector deepening. And you can see it's on many of these different action nodes, activities that are happening. And this is an organization, it is a multi-stakeholder organization, and it's continually overseeing this system and bringing people together and saying, where are the problems? What should we be doing to make this go well? So it's an active steward of the whole change system. So we also ask the question, well, what will this all look like in 2030? It's presuming we're successful at financial inclusion. So you can see this is the map of the new production system. And it's basically the old production system. And down on the right-hand corner, we have, of course, the mobile network operators involved in it now because they're th the main um, factor is how to transfer money electronically. So let's turn to uh, a different look at the finance system and see what's coming up. So number one, we're going to have a lot more turbulence. We're going to have another financial crisis. 
It might be caused by fintech, because we have a lot of uh, new financial technology coming up. Banks are turning into simple switches in a complex node. Their power is disappearing. They're going to have a very different role. The crisis might be caused by the rise of cryptocurrencies. These are going to be challenging governments' fiat currencies at an increasing level. We've only seen it with Bitcoin at any scale right now, but we'll be having more of this. Connectivity, well, fintech's increasing our connectivity, but it's also helping the evolution of something called the ecosystem for financing change. <coughs> and this is a map of all of the sources of money. You know, the challenge is not the, having enough money for the SDGs, it's about creating a system so we have a robust, interacting system of money. And we know the money costs are at record lows, right? So it's about how do we get all of this money flowing so that it's directed in a coherent manner, in a, a manner that everyone loves. So the green uh, <coughs> rectangles here are newly emerging uh, ways of uh, sources of money. So we have the sovereign wealth, whoops, we have the sovereign wealth funds um, with the uh, uh, basically petrodollars plus China. We have remittances, these hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that are flowing from immigrants back to their home country. Uh, we have global goods taxes being applied. We've got, again, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars being raised in taxes applied specifically for global goods production. And that global goods production, that's, uh, examples are with uh, airline taxes, uh, with international financial transaction taxes, and we're gonna have more of these. We have crowdsourcing, which brings together those people who have money and who need money without any intermediary. We have high net worth individuals. Of course, Bill Gates is the archetypical example of this, but there's a lot more around, <coughs> and there's gonna be a lot more who are taking action in this era. And a lot of them are interested in this thing called the impact investing. You know, every September in uh, San Francisco, people are gather around this impact investing, which is basically triple bottom line investing. Uh, and they have hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> so we're developing this new type of system and we need to do a lot better at developing this finance system. Now I'm going to follow up with this map, which you just saw an earlier iteration of because we should never leave to the vision of 2030 without thinking about what the planet is going to look like from a natural systems perspective. And this is something that's being developed by Johan Rockström and my colleagues at Stockholm Resilience Center. And it's a system way of looking at the world. So it gives us a new way to uh, understand this, the, the world and the system and uh, what's necessary for it to be healthy. In addition to what was pointed out earlier, I will point out um, that in this map, uh, which is a bit updated from the earlier one, um, you've got this thing of land system change, which is talking about land that is being filled in uh, for swamps, for deforestation, land degradation. This is all clearly part of your world. But in 2030, we'll be thinking about this as a whole. We won't be thinking about it, oh, it's a climate change problem, right? You know more than that. Yeah, that's beyond a climate change problem, but how do we actually integrate that from a complex point of view? So I hope this look at 2030 has been helpful for you and that it's provided some of the provocative uh, perspectives that you feel free to challenge and also integrate into your work. Because we need to develop and work with this turbulence and connectivity and the spaces it gives for highly innovative and transformational action. And indeed, we need to do this very much for the future of our planet because if we don't do that, we will not have a healthy planet. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm very pleased to be with you here today and look forward to continued participation with you.